Hello there, faithful listener. You've tuned in to Season 7 of the Bible Explained Podcast. So make sure to grab your cup of coffee, because today we are going to be discussing the Book of Acts. Well, hello there and good morning, friends and faithful listeners, and welcome to the Bible Explained Podcast on this lovely, lovely Thursday morning. And I recommend on this chilly Thursday morning, going and grabbing your cup of coffee or for you crazy tea drinkers out there to grab a cup of tea. I actually had somebody reach out to me over the summer with a really great suggestion that I'm considering doing. She told me that I should make a bumper sticker to sell that says, I am a crazy tea drinker. (laughs) And I really like that idea because Now you tea drinkers, you can get some recognition in my shop because everything is like coffee related. Everything that I do pretty much is coffee related. So there will be something in the shop for you crazy tea drinkers out there. (laughs) All right, guys, let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 17. And as you all know, since today is Thursday, we are in the New Testament in the book of Acts. So we're going to be reading Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Make sure to grab your Bible along with your cup of coffee or your cup of tea this morning. And I will be reading this out of the W.E.B. as usual. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who met him. Some of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers also were conversing with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be advocating foreign deities because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. They took hold of him and brought him to the area Pegasus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is, which you are speaking about? For you bring certain strange things to our ears. We want to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers living there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Paul stood in the middle of the area Pegasus and said, You men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious in all things. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship in ignorance, I announce to you. The God who made the world and all the things in it, he being the Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. He isn't served by men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he himself gives to all life and breath and all things. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the surface of the earth, having determined appointed seasons and the boundaries of their dwellings, that they should seek the Lord, if perhaps they might reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live, Move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art and design of man. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked, but now he commands that all people everywhere should repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, of which he has given assurance to all men in that he has raised him from the dead. Now, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we want to hear you again concerning this. Thus, Paul went out from them, but certain men joined with him and believed among whom also was Dionysus, the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So the first thing I found so funny, actually, about this portion of scripture is the fact that Timothy and Silas stayed behind in Berea. And Paul actually, I think, was expecting them to build up the church even further in Berea. But then the second that Paul gets into Athens, he writes a letter to Silas and Timothy. And he's like, get down here right now. The Bereans are fine. The Athenians really need us. (laughs) And I found that really funny because... When we read this on Tuesday, I actually ended up stopping at verse 15 and I was super confused as to why, because I didn't read ahead, of course, I was confused as to why Paul 
told them to stay in Berea and then immediately asked them to come to Athens. And then now it makes a lot of sense now that Paul is in Athens because it says that Paul waited for them at Athens and his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. (laughs) So Paul, of course, is touring this ancient, beautiful city because it was basically ancient at the point that Paul was seeing it. Athens was once the greatest city in the world, pretty much. And now by the time Paul is here, it's not uh, the, the greatest city anymore. Rome was. But yet there was still many, many wonderful things in Athens. And I'm sure Paul, in some way, was kind of excited to tour Athens and see all the beautiful uh, things that Athens produced. But yet on every street corner, it seemed like there was an idol and Paul was getting provoked, like his spirit was anxious because of how many false idols he saw around the city. So this is one of the first times that I can remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we see Paul going and speaking in the marketplace, like publicly, because usually from my remembrance of Paul, we saw him going to the temples or going to a place of worship with the Jews and then speaking to whoever, whatever Greeks came to the Jewish temple at that point. But this is the first time I can remember seeing Paul street preaching. And that's because I think he was so concerned with how many idols and idolatry that he saw around Athens that he was willing to go out of his comfort zone and street preach in order to find any person that was willing to listen to him so that he could have a conversation with them. Now, he did, of course, still go to the temple. That's what it says here. It says in verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and also in the marketplace every day with those who met him. He is going to the temple as well. But Paul had this urgency. The people of Athens needed to hear the gospel. And so Paul was going to figure out how he was going to reach the most people. And of course, the marketplace in Athens, I'm sure was like the busiest spot in the entire city. So that's where Paul is going. And he's reasoning with any person that would come and talk with him. So now at this point in time, as Paul is waiting for Silas and Timothy to get down to Athens from Berea, which I don't think it would take that long to get from Berea to Athens. Berea was more in like the middle of Greece and Athens, of course, is at the very bottom, like near the coastline. I don't think it would take like a a crazy amount of days for Silas and Timothy to get down. But while Paul is waiting, he is preaching and he's meeting people and he ends up meeting these philosophers. So he meets these Stoic philosophers and also these Epicurean philosophers. And some of them are like looking at Paul being like, He's a babbler. What is he trying to say? He's just talking nonsense. And then other people are like, well, he's he seems to be talking about some sort of foreign deity. And it says, because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. So because they had never heard of Jesus before in Athens, they thought Paul was speaking of a foreign God. So these philosophers come up to Paul and they're kind of just like, we want to hear more about what you have to say. And that just reminds me of any story I've ever heard of a Greek philosopher. They just want to talk. They want to think about things. They want to muse. And that's basically what Luke says here, the author of Acts. It's very funny. It says in verse 21, all the Athenians and the strangers living there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. (laughs) Man, Luke is like throwing shade at the Athenians here. He's just like, yeah, they don't want to do anything other than like prattle on about the newest controversy or the newest thing that's hitting the market or whatever else, the newest idea, the newest deity, whatever they can talk about that's new is what the Athenians want to talk about. So of course, when Paul is speaking in the marketplace and people are listening to him, they want to hear more about what Paul is saying, because if they like to hear about new things, they clearly want to hear about what Paul has to say. So, of course, Paul gladly goes. And this is now the famous sermon at Mars Hill. And you guys might recognize that name Mars Hill because there was a very famous church. I think it was in Seattle that was named Mars Hill. And it ended up basically disbanding because the 
the head pastor was kind of a nut. He was a nutcase. But I don't know why you would ever name your church Mars Hill because Mars Hill stated here in scripture is not a good place. It's like a place of idolatry and a place of just many gods. So I have no clue why anybody would be like, hey, it's a great idea to name our church Mars Hill. (laughs) But Paul goes to this place called Mars Hill, or as the W.E.B. says, the Areopagus. And Paul gladly starts speaking to all the philosophers that are gathered around to hear him. And he says, you men of Athens, I perceive that you are very religious in all things. So Paul really was a great speaker. Even this opening, he compliments the people of Athens. He says, you know, I can tell that you you guys are very religious and that you you want to think about these things. And that's a compliment. And the other thing that Paul actually does is he switches his language, because if you notice the other sermons that Paul preached specifically to the Jews as well, he often started out with discussing something about scripture, but that's not what he's doing here. He's, he's like going to the bare bones basics with the Athenians because they have never heard of the gospel before, and they likely had no clue about the laws of the Old Testament or the prophets or anything like that. So Paul switches his language completely when giving this message. And that's very important to do. Depending on who you are talking to, it's extremely important to switch your language so that the person you are talking to can understand. So if they have a very basic knowledge of scripture, sometimes it's it's best to just you know, talk to them about what they understand and give them a very simplistic gospel message. But if you're talking to somebody who is an atheist, who has a really good understanding of the Bible, let's say, it might be better to talk to that person with scriptural references or science that backs up scripture. It just depends on who you talk to. You have to make the truth acceptable to whoever you are discussing it with. And I think that there's a verse similar to that, but I I don't remember what it is. I'm sorry. So Paul starts out by not, you know, stating really advanced topics to them. He just says, I can see that you guys are very religious. And then he says, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So apparently there was an altar in Athens that was specifically for an unknown God. So the Greeks wanted to cover all their bases (laughs) just in case somewhere out there they forgot to worship a God that they didn't know about. They wanted to make sure all their bases were covered. And so they actually had a shrine or an object of worship to an unknown God. And so Paul noticed that as he's walking around Athens and he's probably like, what in the world? But he mentions this. He says, I saw an object of your worship and with this inscription to an unknown God. So what you worship in ignorance, I will tell you who he is. The God who made the world and all things in it, he being the Lord of heaven and earth, doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. I'm sure that this is blowing some of their minds, but he says he isn't served by men's hands. He doesn't need anything. He gives everything to everybody. So Paul's like, you give these things to your gods, but Yahweh, God, does not need a single thing from you because he actually made everything. He made you. He made the earth and everything in the earth. And so we can't actually give anything to God is what Paul says. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the surface of the earth. And he determined what the seasons were. He determined what the boundaries of the seasons were. For example, spring, however long spring is and however long winter is, God determined the boundaries of those particular seasons. God did all of this. And then in verse 27, so that men will seek the Lord, if perhaps they might reach out for him and find him because he is not far from each one of us. I think that's a very beautiful verse, actually. God is not far from any one of us. He shows himself through creation all the time. There's actually a verse where it says that God displayed his glory through creation. And that means that people can look at creation and understand that there is a creator, even if they've never heard of God before. And that's kind of what Paul says here. 
God made all these things so that people would seek the Lord and find him because he is not far from us. For in him we live, move, and have our being. So without God, we cannot move. We cannot take another breath. We can't do anything without God giving us power. And that's what Paul says here. God caused us to live and we can't live without him. As some of your own poets have said, and this is, this is the part I love. You know, once again, Paul is, is speaking to the Athenians in a way that they can understand. This also shows how very well educated Paul was, because not only did he speak multiple languages, but he also was apparently very well read. And he was reading their philosophers and, and reading some of their poems and all this other stuff so he could prepare himself to speak to the Greeks who had no knowledge of the gospel. So some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art and design of man. And I think that verse is very important because nothing that we can do is divine nature. We are not doing anything to contribute to God's divinity. He is divine. We are not. Nothing we make contributes to God's godliness, if that makes sense. Because once again, he's speaking to philosophers here. And one particular group of philosophers he was speaking to were actually the Stoic philosophers. And I looked into the Stoic philosophers. And of course, we, we know the word Stoicism, right? But Stoic philosophers way back in Greek culture, not only did they look at things very even mindedly, but they also believed that God was in everything and everything was in God. So Paul is kind of putting that theory to a test by saying, well, you know, God made everything and we can't contribute anything to God. Nothing we do adds to God. And he's directly challenging the beliefs and the ideas of the stoic philosophers that he's speaking to in this room. So he says, nothing we contribute, no art, no gold, no silver, nothing we engrave contributes to God's divine nature. Then verse 30, the times of ignorance, therefore God overlooked, but now he commands that all people everywhere should repent. So now he's getting into the heart of the gospel message, repentance and salvation. At a certain point in time, God overlooked the ignorance of people. Because they didn't have the gospel message. And so now Paul is saying, because Jesus came and because we have salvation when we believe in Jesus, now is the time for repentance. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And that means the second coming of Christ by the man he has ordained. In other words, Jesus Christ, of which God has given assurance to all men, basically about Jesus in that he has raised Jesus from the dead. And so now Paul finishes his speech. And it says, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some of the philosophers in that room mocked Paul because they're like, no way, no way can anybody raise from the dead. That is not possible. That cannot happen. But others said, we want to hear you again concerning these things. So some people were very open to it. And they were very interested in what Paul had to say and maybe never heard about the resurrection of the dead ever before. It sounded very interesting to them. And so Paul left the uh, Mars Hill and he went out and continued doing what he was doing, waiting for Timothy and Silas. But certain men, it says in verse 34, joined with him and believed. And there was a guy specifically named Dionysus, Dionysius, the area area. Pegate, <laughs> I'm sorry, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So it doesn't sound like a lot of people in Athens at this point in time really accepted the gospel message, but Paul is going to do more work here in Athens and he's going to speak to more people about the gospel message. And what Paul said here at Mars Hill did strike a chord with quite a lot of people. And even right away, some people were like, yes, this makes sense. I need this. I need this gospel message that Paul is presenting to me. So you never know how God will use you. 
like I said, you have to make the truth acceptable to people. You have to tailor how you're speaking to certain people, especially if you want to present to them the gospel message. But even if you're talking to somebody who has literally no knowledge about the Bible or the gospel whatsoever, even if it might seem basic to you, you never know how it might affect the person you are sharing it with. I really liked this portion of scripture. I thought it was very interesting how Paul tailored his speech to speak to the Athenians. And it's kind of funny that Paul had to to tailor the gospel message in a very, very basic way to these philosophers. But faithful listeners, I will see you guys tomorrow for an episode out of First Samuel. We're going to talk about the Israelites receiving the Ark of the Covenant and everything that happens there. And uh, it's a little more interesting than you might think. It's very interesting. So tune in to tomorrow's episode out of the Old Testament in First Samuel. But guys, I hope that you have a fantastic rest of your Thursday. Happy listening and God bless. Thank you.